Good evening. My name is Byron Johns with the NAACP Parents Council and co-founder of the Black and Brown Coalition. We're glad to have you here this evening. First, American Sign Language interpretation for this event is available by viewing on MCPS TV cable channels, Comcast 34, Verizon 36, RCN 89, Condado TV, which is Comcast 33, Verizon 35, RCN 88. The MCPS homepage on the web and MCPS TV and MCPS TV Espanol YouTube channels also. Language interpretation in Zoom, to access that within the Zoom session, click the interpretation option in the webinar controls. Then click the language you desire. Buenas noches a todos y a todas. Gracias por participar esta noche. Mi nombre es Diego Uriburu, de Identity y también del Black and Brown Coalition. Para aquellos que, que requieran interpretación simultánea, por favor, abajo de la pantalla hay un círculo con un mapa a, la, a, su, a su derecha que dice interpretación, lo apretan, lo presionan y ahí eligen el lenguaje que ustedes quieren escuchar. Elijan español para español. Bueno, también, bueno, cuando se vaya este mensaje empezamos. As soon as this, this message disappears, there we go. So, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Buenas noches, everyone. Uh, good evening, Byron and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for being here tonight, everyone. This is a very special occasion when Dr. McKnight usually speaks to the community, she has to speak to the larger community. Tonight, we have a great opportunity where she will speak directly to our black and brown students and parents and families. <clears throat> she will respond to some of our questions and your questions in a way that, <clears throat> that we will understand. And when responding to the questions, she will, she will be doing so via the lens of our black and brown families. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Byron. We're very excited and we'll begin right now, Byron. Thank you, Diego. The intent of tonight's conversation is meant to be informative and respectful. The dialogue is intended to be an exchange of ideas that will benefit the community as a whole. To accomplish this, tonight's session has been structured so that we can maximize Dr. McKnight's time, as well as the time of those attending the session. As we cover various topics with Dr. McKnight, you may submit a question via the Q&A functionality. These questions will be monitored and prioritized based on the topic, the remaining time and overall impact to the community. For some questions, answers will be documented after the meeting and made available to our parent representatives at a later time. Greetings, Dr. McKnight, and welcome. Before we start our dialogue, we'd like to offer you the opportunity to address the audience and make opening comments. Thank you so much, and what a nice evening to spend together and just spend some time having important conversation around why we're all here and we have a collective mission to accomplish together. I'm Monifa McKnight, the Interim Superintendent for Montgomery County Public Schools. And I wanna thank all of our families and our staff and our students, everyone who have committed some time and when you could be doing many other things to come and sit and have this really important conversation with us this evening. 
So I just want to share, share that I thank you for that. Um, and I, I will tell you, I can't thank you enough uh, just for everything that our community have done to come together during this pandemic. It has not been an easy time and it hasn't been easy because we're the largest school system in the state. And we also wanna be very intentional about how every decision that we make, that we make impacts every student and every family. And that means we have to know who every student is and we have to know every family and the circumstances around them that are represented in Montgomery County to do that. So I do look forward to us having conversation tonight and taking your questions so that I can also hear about your hopes and dreams for your children, our children, because this is all about how we make our school system better. And I need to understand that and I need to hear that from you. And then you also need to hear from me how I intend to work tirelessly to accomplish that and make that happen. And before I go any further, I do wanna personally thank Mr. Byron Johns and Mr. Diego Yurburu, because when I came back as a deputy superintendent uh, a couple of years ago, they were meeting with me in my office the day that I was moving in. <laughs> I had not situated everything in my office yet, but to me that said that it was really important for them to connect with me as a district leader to make sure I understood their purpose, your purpose, and how we would work together to have that partnership. And so over the past two years, over many conversations, uh, we have been able to continue to build that relationship and discuss our collective interests. And so I do wanna thank them for that because I know it is a commitment of time and you're representing many voices, which is not easy, but you have done that and you've done it uh, relentlessly um, in advocating for the work that needs to be done. As I met uh, Mr. Johns and Mr. Yurubu in my office, I became quickly impressed about the vision and passion that was all around how do we eliminate inequities that exist for black and brown children. That was very personal to me. And of course I engaged immediately in that discussion because I have many reasons to do so. So I grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina, a small town, graduated from South Carolina State University. And I will tell you, I really did not enjoy or become the engaged student until I got into college and got into education. I did fine in school, but in terms of me enjoying it and feeling like I really made a connection with a lot of my uh, teachers along the way, um, you know, I, I, I look back on it and I said, there was so much more that could have been done for me to engage in my day-to-day -day education uh, and, and experience as a student. Um, and so that's why this is impersonal to me because engagement is important. You only have one opportunity to go through a K through 12 career and how that experience is mapped out and how every student engages in it. And they engage in it based on what the environment says to them about the importance of who they are and what they can bring is critical. So that's why this is important to me and we share a similar mission um, there and what we need to accomplish for our students. I also wanna say that I grew up in a household in which it was very clear that education was gonna be the great equalizer for my sisters and I. I have two older sisters and for my, my cousins and our family generally. Growing up in South Carolina, um, you know, the, the, many, many things come along with that. And um, I was very apparent about the impact of race and the uh, impact of education and opportunities and how you have to be acutely aware of how those entities work together. My mother was a food services worker in the public school system and my father was a building services worker. And they emphasized the importance of my sisters and I having an education so that we would have opportunities that we chose for our lives beyond opportunities that were presented to them, okay? And so I say that to you because this is something that we have to keep alive in a well for our children, for them to look just beyond where they are right now, but for us to remind them about how important it is um, for every, every decision that they make, every opportunity they get, for every bit of inspiration or encouragement that we give them, that it matters because it all contributes to the future that they are establishing for themselves. And we wanna support them in that. So I say that today, starting out with a promise and a commitment. One, because this is deeply personal to me, very personal. And if every single one of our students in this school system are not successful, I'm not successful. The school system is not successful. And everyone in between every student and every family and in the school system has to see that problem in the same way. Because when students then are not successful, then that we also have to quickly see how that's not optional for us. I'm also the proud mother of a nine-year-old son. 
Um, and as I sit and have the conversation often about things that impact our students, you know, I, I, I understand that from a, from a parent lens as well. Um, my son has, a no, you know, have many privileges that I did not have growing up. But even with some of those privileges that he has, I still see a number and a number of inequities and in some place have had to step in throughout his career to make sure he has exactly what he needs. So I come from that perspective because I also get to see, sit in the seat as a parent and I bring that to the experience as interim superintendent daily. Um, I also have a husband who is in the field of service. He is a social worker in Baltimore City. Now we end up passing each other often because he works the night shift and I'm normally not getting home until night, but... <laughs> Um, you know, we both do have that connection around making commitments on behalf of our communities, because I truly believe what we do is not in service to ourselves, but to others. And so that's something that lives alive and well in our household as well. So before we get into questions, I do want to just talk about some of my interests and how that plays out into the role that I serve in in MCPS. I've talked about this being very personal to me. But be it being personal, me caring about it is not enough. It, it, it truly is about how that comes into action and how all the staff that support my vision and my interest in every interaction and every bit of work that is planned in Montgomery County um, focuses on that. So let's talk about what drives that action for a quick moment. And one is the fact that there is an opportunity gap for students of color that have gone on far too long and in many ways have troubled me and, and, and the issues continue to come up um, around why are we still living some of these same circumstances that all of us have had much time to correct and make change. And that ultimately means that we have to have a strong commitment every day to disrupt the status quo. And that means we have to disrupt it because it is simply not good enough for too many of our students. And today, just uh, a few hours ago, I was in a, a work session with the Board of Education. And again, we were talking about the impact of um, programs, and again, how their disproportionality and who is being served in what way for black and brown students. And then I immediately took that accountability and said, so my, my uh, expectation with the staff is that when we come and present information at the board table, we are starting from that lens. It is not an afterthought. We just shouldn't be talking about disproportionality and how we're not meeting the needs of students when we're talking about the anti-racist audit or we're talking about the equity structure, structure in MCPS. It has to be involved in every single conversation that we have and every program that we have um, because it truly is disheartening when we look at our student outcomes and see that the gap has been wide for much longer than it should be. But now we're dealing with the fact that that gap has widened as a result of COVID-19. And so we need to be immediately reactive to that and be keenly aware that not only we're being reactive to things that have impacted our students and their learning, but we're also being reactive to a number of other circumstances that were elevated by COVID. And I'll call out social emotional learning um, to be one of the, the main ones because our families have experienced so much trauma during this period due to the pandemic, death, illness, financial uh, uh, insecurity, food insecurity, all of the things that stress us in our day-to-day -day lives. So I say that to say that these are the problems that I look forward to us delving in tonight. We are a diverse community in Montgomery County Public Schools. Our demographic is that 34% of our students are Latino, Latinx students, 25% uh, are white, 22% of our students are African-American, 14% Asian, and 5% multiracial. That is a strength in our community to live in a place that is that diverse because that means it's up to us, it's up to every student, it's up to every family to be exposed to things that really broadens, broadens and widens our perspective about who we share this community with and how we share the issues together. Um, and so I do look forward to us tackling some of those issues. They range from how do we create structures to address the disruption and the disproportionality we see in student learning and suspension and everything else, so how do we make sure we are putting efforts in place to diversify the staff in our system that represents the students that we serve? Again, a conversation that has gone on far too long and it actually starts with me. Um, and and I, I look forward to us getting, to, getting into that tonight because I'd like to be able to share some ideas and thoughts that I've been reflecting on around how we take on some of the challenges in a very different way and in a process that doesn't represent us following the same processes that we've had in place before. 
I close out by sharing when I took on the reins of the interim superintendent, I served as the deputy superintendent, as I shared under Dex, Jack Smith, and I had an opportunity to work shoulder to shoulder with him coming in um, when we were wrapping up the ERS study in which we learned a lot about our school system and areas of growth and opportunity. Um, during my tenure as an uh, interim superintendent and serving one of the largest uh, school systems, we've been able to accomplish some things, serving one of our largest summer school programs. But as I share that, that's just one example of if this past summer was our first time ever serving the largest number of students that we have ever been able to serve in Montgomery County Public Schools, that means we can break history again. And it starts with us talking about these issues that we're going to get into tonight that are really important, that really address the disparities uh, that I've been, I've been sharing thus far. So I look forward to sharing the work that we're doing in MCPS. And I'm also even more so looking forward to seeing the fruits of that labor and hearing from you and working with you to solve this problem as a collective community that we all must own together and actively work, uh, work on together. So thank you for that. I know I said a lot, but you know, I am very passionate about this and I look forward to us continuing this discussion. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Monifa, I am going to Take a moment before Byron starts to guide people to, to where the interpretation button is. <clears throat> I say it first in Spanish and then in English. Aquellos de nosotros que tenemos problemas con la interpretación, en su pantalla abajo hay unas, unos dibujitos, unas, eh, eh, <clears throat> unas palabras. Hay una palabra que dice interpretation, es interpretación. Si ustedes presionan ese botón, le va a aparecer una lista de lenguajes Ustedes presionan español o el que quiera. Okay? So I'm saying that those of you who need interpretation, if you go to the bottom of the screen, you have different um, symbols, and there's a symbol like the world, or maybe you have a different symbol, but look for the word interpretation. And if you press that, you can choose whatever language, uh, the language of your preference. I hope that helps. Byron, thank you. Great. Thank you, Diego. And thank you, Dr. McKnight. So if uh, our other panelists would turn their cameras on, we're going to start our conversation. And I will start with the elephant in the room, which is talking about COVID and the impact in the operations. First, Dr. McKnight, uh, MCPS's responses to the evolving COVID pandemic has been changing and obviously it's been challenging. And at times it's been confusing and conflicting. Can you please help us understand the internal and external issues that are affecting MCPS's responses? And with that, what changes uh, will be implemented to improve their response going forward? Thank you, uh, Mr. Johns. I first want to say we have a clear plan for managing COVID. We've had a plan. We started out this year sharing that we had a contingency plan in case things came up. What we didn't know is that every, every variant that comes out as a result of COVID-19, <laughs> everyone is unique. We opened up school with the Delta variant. And at that time, we were learning that the Delta variant was more impactful to children. But we continued. We forged ahead and we opened up schools successfully. And then the Omicron variant uh, came upon us in December, and that took us like a storm, as well as every other school system across the state and nation, because here this variant is highly transmissible, transmissible, very contagious, and impacted our staffing in ways that we just did not imagine it so quickly. So I, I share that with you because having a plan is one part of it, but being flexible ab about something that we continue to learn and don't know is a part of the challenge. Um, with that said, while it is a part of the challenge, we are committed to doing every single thing in our power to address some of the internal and external challenges that we've experienced so that we can get better every day and every time a new variant comes along. So I have consistently said that I have a deep commitment to doing everything we can to keeping our schools open for in-person learning. Our data says to us that this is critical and must be a priority, must be a priority. Now, yes, there was a time in which we had to go virtual because we were experiencing the pandemic for the first time, did not understand everything that was involved in it, 
and had to set up a virtual learning environment um, immediately for our students because there were no other options. But any educator will tell you, education is a face-to-face, -face, people type of profession. We, connect, we make connections and build relationships with students every single day in our schools. We build relationships with families, constantly trying to figure out what their needs are and how we can put supports in place for them to support their children so that children are coming to school prepared and having everything that they need. And so sometimes that's not just supporting the student, but it's supporting the entire family. But I also say that it becomes even more critical for black and brown students. And preserving in-person learning has been a tremendous effort led by our staff. And we continue to have that commitment because our students need to be in the room with an adult to best learn the content that we are teaching them to build the relationships that I'm speaking of. With that said, while we've tried to keep schools open and we have been able to keep our schools open, I also recognize that there are a lot of questions and people have concerns around health and other operational reasons that really do put a strain on our commitment to being able to provide that in-person learning to students. So we've been examining um, uh, five criteria areas, staff absences, student absences, unfilled substitute uh, vacancies, positions, it could be teacher positions or other positions, just not having a sub, the underserved bus routes that we've been able, unable to provide with staff shortages and looking at COVID-19 case rates. When we look at all of those factors, that tells us a story of do we have everything in place to provide a good school day for every single student in all 209 of our schools? It starts with that question, okay? Because we can have every teacher show up to a school, but if there are no cafeteria workers, if there are no building services workers, if there um, is no office staff, the school cannot function. And so it just speaks to why the element of a school depends on so many different functions. And I'm, I'm proud to share that one of the, 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 the plans that we've come out to manage, particularly the Omicron variant that have really put a strain on us with staffing, is that we were looking at those five areas and said, we need to look at them and then have conversations with our schools when we look at all of those factors, those five factors and look at the numbers and invite our schools into a conversation to say, are you functioning? Are you barely functioning? And when I say functioning, it means, does the school day look as if it should? Are students in the classroom with their teachers? Um, or are they somewhere in a holding space because we don't have a staff member teaching them? In high school, do we have a social studies teacher trying to teach a foreign language class who has no experience in foreign language? To me, that's not a quality education. And it becomes even more not quality depending on how long those circumstances occur. You can have a teacher cover a class one day, two days, but when we start to look at a teacher, you know, a social studies teacher covering a foreign language class for a week, that's an issue. And so what I wanted us to do was look at those factors centrally and look at the numbers and invite schools to come in to share their story of how are we doing? Do we feel like we can continue to provide a quality education experience to our students? Or do we think we need to move to virtual for 10 days to stabilize the conditions? The important part of that process is I didn't want it to be a top-down decision. I don't want to make that, well, every decision rests with me, but it shouldn't start with me telling individually 209 schools what they should do. What I prefer to do is to have a collection of those who are in that school parents, the principals, the staff who represent teachers, building service workers, cafeterias workers to come together and say, okay, with all of the conditions that are happening, how are we doing? And do we all see us functioning at a level in which we can or we should not function? And so that team has really been critical. Uh, we transition our, our, our first set of schools will be transitioning tomorrow on Thursday. And that process has been one that we uh, just started out, but great things have come from it because what we're finding from our schools are when they engage those group of stakeholders, which is exactly what we should always do when it comes down to our decisions, because in a diverse community, we have to look at many different perspectives when making decisions. Those schools have been able to come forward and say, here's our circumstance and here's what we think is best for us. They then make that recommendation to my um, to my executive team. And then we take all those factors and ultimately support their decision. I will give you an example. 
we had a school who were, um, we had 16 schools go virtual, but we started out 17. And one of those schools said, when we invited them into the conversation, we know what the numbers look like, but here are the supports that we put in place to address these issues. We have the community, you know, community members coming in helping with this, and we're okay. We wanna protect the in-person learning experience. And so I share that with you because it's really important that our schools have a collection of voices, especially when we're talking to community members or parents to be involved in that discussion, because I do want our parents to feel like um, decisions that are made uh, within the school aren't decisions that are done to them, but they're a part of the process. So I highlight that as the first round of processes that we started, we actually started on Friday, January 14th, and then yesterday we announced the 16 schools who are transitioning to virtual for the next 10 days. So when schools must transition to virtual, our commitment is to communicate promptly and clearly and provide ongoing support to school communities. And I'm asking our families when that doesn't happen, we know that members of our community are gonna tell us immediately when we do something wrong, but we also know that some of us are busy and may not have the time to do that. Elevate it to others who can make sure then they elevate it to the school system because it's the only way that we can change and make those adjustments that are meaningful to you. Um, the final thing that I'll say is, you know, there are other components of our plan that really do include mitigation strategies um, that I wanna make sure you're aware of when we are bringing our students back to school. We are providing the rapid tests in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services and our vast county council to continue to support um, the Department of Health and Human Services and other government agencies to make sure that we have those test kits so they can be in the hands of our staff and families. We've provided the KN95 masks to our staff and students. We've improved the air filtration system in our schools. And we've done all of that because we want our community to feel comfortable that we've done everything that we can to make sure we've made the environment safe for our students because we do need them in school having that in-person experience. Now we've also created options individually for families. So yes, we had 16 schools as of tomorrow who are transitioning to the virtual environment. But I also know that every circumstance, again, doesn't come across in a broad way. We have a virtual academy that was set up so that families could apply to that academy if they knew they were in special circumstances in which the child may have had um, some compromises to their system with their immune system, or they could live in a household with someone and they just didn't want to have the day-to-day -day interaction of a child going to school. But of course, we have limits on the virtual academy. What we've also put in place is we've provided the flexibility if a family feels very concerned about them or their child being vulnerable right now during this Omicron variant, we have made a provision in which we have provided um, video streaming services to students in elementary on Canvas and to our high school students through Zoom to be able to access learning virtually until January 31st. And they can call their schools and request an excused absence if that is what they choose to do. We have our fingers crossed that January 31st brings us something different with this Omicron variant. But if it doesn't, we will of course be flexible and extend that timeline. Um, so that along with filling critical shortages around staff, uh, substitute bus drivers, we're working on all of those things. And we are continuing to establish a stronger communication and collaboration within the district. We've been managing crises now for almost two years. And so communication, we've learned a lot about communication, a lot of changes that we have to make. And we've also solicited, solicited um, much help in that area to do that. So I just wanted to hit those highlight um, areas of communications being one, one part of our um, struggle, quite frankly, throughout the entire pandemic, because it's been an ongoing crisis. Um, and so learning how you manage that and for all families is uh, really key. So we'll continue to work on that and continue to shift our approaches as they are necessary in navigating these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Um, we will transition just to keep on schedule. I'll invite Diego to uh, lead the next conversation, on the next topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Byron. Dr. McKnight, <clears throat> our black and brown parents are very, very worried. They were worried prior to the pandemic because of the achievement gap that negatively impacted our black and brown students. And then the pandemic made things a lot worse. <clears throat> so if you could tell us specifically, what are the key strategies that you and your team are going to put in place, or have already put in place in order to, to redress the tremendous learning loss that has occurred in the past two years? If you could be as specific as possible, 
it would be great. Yes. So the first thing that we can do as a community to make sure that our black and brown children are getting the education that they need is feel confident. And if you don't feel confident, let us know what we can do to feel confident to make sure their students are in school for in-person learning. That's the first thing that we can do to improve the gap that has widened as a result of COVID-19. And that's why I absolutely started with that. Um, it's gonna take time for our students to recover. A few things that we've done, and I add these as uh, aids to giving our students extra time to learn some of those concepts that they didn't get while they were virtual for a long period of time and to get that extra support. Um, we have tutoring services that we're providing to students. Some, some are providing, um, some schools are providing that in person. I visited a school recently who had a tutoring, elementary school tutoring program available in person um, twice a week for their students coming in an hour early to get that tutoring from their teachers. Uh, so that's one example of something that we're doing to, to create time for students to spend more time with content to know and understand exactly what that is. It is critical to close learning gaps, which existed prior to the pandemic, um, because again, they've been exasperated. But I'm also gonna say, we've gotta provide high quality teaching and learning while also focusing on student social emotional support. Now, let me talk about that teaching and learning piece for a minute, because there's accountability that comes with that. When our students go into our classrooms every single day, and this is why I emphasize we can't do this right without having the staff, because that means they need to be in front of a high quality teacher that believes in them and their potential. And it starts with that. Um, and so the other thing that we have to do, must do, and have begun and will continue to do is make sure that we're working with our staff to make them culturally responsive and proficient so that they start every lesson, every content, every interaction with the child, believing in the opportunity that they have. We can have structure set up all day long, but if that educator does not believe and does not support that student, um, then those structures will not make a difference in the achievement gap that we're talking about. So that's the other piece, that professional development is supported, supporting, supporting a structure that needs to be in place, to support our staff um, who are in fact working with our students. And then I also wanna focus on the process of school improvement. Now school improvement has been a while along, around the process for a while, but the purpose of school improvement is to make sure there is accountability in place for a school to look at every single student within that school and be able to look at measures academic measures to see if they are on target to meet those benchmark uh, learning objectives or not. And so personalizing that process even more, having that conversation with the principals, meaning the principals have to have that conversations with their teachers, the third grade team, the 11th grade social studies department, the ninth grade math department to be able to say who's learning and who is not, because that's when the accountability comes into place for every school to say, how are we addressing the instructional needs to make sure they're meeting the needs of our students? And that's how black and brown students are not left out of that conversation or they're not thrown into a whole conglomerate of, 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 of numbers and we don't know who they are and we don't know intentionally what their needs are. So intentionally looking at those benchmark assessments and reading and going back to third grade reading. Third grade is gonna become even more important because this year, our third graders were first graders who first had their, uh, their education interrupted when they had to go home from schools in March of 2020, okay? So third grade should be the mark in which we're, we're really looking at development for reading and literacy. And I call that out because it's really important because reading is so fundamental to students being able to access additional content. So following those students, and I say third graders, but it's also our second graders, who were kindergartners, who didn't have a full year of learning that were impacted by COVID, and looking at who those students are, looking at them in these, in these uh, identified groups that we look at through the evidence of learning model, which holds the system and the school accountable for whether these schools, these students are progressing or not. And so you all know very well, it's going back to those ERS questions and what does opportunity not access look like for students who are continuing to progress to be able to get into those courses that creates a pathway for them to um, get into higher level courses when they get into secondary. So I, I call those out. Additionally, we're also 
um, putting additional supports in place for students who we know need that extra support. Like for instance, we've recommended in our budget um, 21 additional ESOL teachers to help meet our student needs because we know that we want to not strain um, our ESOL students to uh, teachers so that they are not having a small number of students to work with, but we wanna make sure that number is manageable. We also continue to look at learning loss and think about how we can be innovative um, about traditional school structures. For example, we have two schools that have an additional 30 days of school. We're evaluating that model because we know that an extended year for many students is what helps us. So we've had two schools for the past two, three years who are in extended year. What have we learned from that? And what does that data say to us about what we need to shift in those spaces and possibly expand because those are the, I use it as an example because when we get into programs and you know, we know what some of them are, KIPP, you know, programs that provide extra time for students and things like that. Those are programs that we haven't always embraced in Montgomery County, but we really need, there's lots of research out there about how some components of these programs can be built into the structure of how we serve all of our students in MCPS to give them what they need. And I called out KIPP because that's very similar to extra time and longer school days and things like that. But that's exactly what we tried to accomplish in our innovative calendar schools. So looking at that data and saying, how do we restructure models of schooling to address these areas? So Monifa, I just want to go a little bit more specifically. So you mentioned more time, you mentioned the pilots, but when will MCPS, and we all probably agree that more time is great, but when will MCPS make decisions as to as to, okay, we're going to extend the school year or, or extend this summer school. So when, by when would you make decisions? And for everyone else that's listening, what I heard is more time with the most affected students. Face-to-face -face is critical. Uh, having teachers that are experienced and, high, and believe in our students have high expectations of them. Uh, <clears throat> school improvement plan where each school and its principal are held accountable. That's what I heard. And then the issue of third grade uh, reading. Uh, but by, by when will MCPS have a plan that we can read and understand? Okay, I wanna go back to, you said, making sure that every principal in school is accountable. I wanna be specific, accountable to making sure we are meeting the needs of all of our students. And that specifically means looking at our black and brown students. And I, I just have to call that out because it's, it's very important. <clears throat> um, but in terms of the timeline, so, Diego, you actually know this, this best. When we are planning for the upcoming year, we start those conversations in the fall of the current year. So for instance, we have our, uh, our community schools that we started last year and we've identified them because those are our, uh, our schools that we put additional resources um, in to be able to support getting extra staff, to support student learning, to be able to have small groups, to support literacy learning, all of those pieces. So we start the process in the fall to always be prepared to implement the following year. There are some times in which we don't start it in the fall. Um, we may start maybe in the winter, depending on the scope of the project that we still can implement in the fall. But we do try to spend the time, at least six months to a year, to pull the research, look at the data for implementation the following year. So I will tell you, we talked about innovative calendar schools. One thing that we're doing right now is pulling that group back together and looking at all of the data um, because we are looking to expand uh, that, not this coming year, because quite frankly, this has been another year of COVID, but the following year. And what we wanna do is have our parents who've been a part of that model already, help us figure out what's worked, what hasn't, and um, what we wanna take into further expansion, if that's what we decide to do based on what the data tells us. Well, I, I, I don't wanna take more time from my, my fellow uh, panelists, uh, it'd be great. We, the community, need a plan, and we know as, as soon as you can get it and know you're working in best practices, uh, we need it because for us it's like a roadmap as to how you are going to help us help our children recover, and we can then support it our, our, our homes. I was going to ask you about social and emotional supports, but I don't have time for that. I do want to echo what my fellow <clears throat> attendees have said prior is that a social and emotional plan that, that is developed for everyone will probably not meet the needs of our black and brown students. So, so this is a time to be innovative and to be culturally specific. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Lisa 
and apologize, Lisa, for stealing a minute or two from you. Now that's okay, De Diego. Now I have to speed talk Dr. Minite. Hi, Dr. Minite. My name is Lisa Taylor, and I'm on the Parents Council, and I have three children at Bethesda Chevy Chase. My first question is, based on the 2018 ERS data, more than 50% of Black and 60% of Brown students are in math courses by their 12th grade year. Um, you did talk a little bit about, and Diego very well summarized what we've done to date, but the question is, what is MCPS doing to improve specifically math outcomes for Black and Brown students? Thank you, Lisa, for that question. And I'm gonna start with the course that the ERS study called out specifically, um, and that's algebra. Uh, you know, when the state of Maryland follows the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards, which calls for algebra to be, be taught in ninth grade, uh, we knew and had the vision a while back in MCPS that algebra needs to be taught earlier than ninth grade. So in MCPS, algebra is taught to most students in seventh or eighth grade, um, both according to MSDE and those who are above grade level. I'll also say in MCPS, algebra taught in grade nine is perceived as being below level when it still falls within the expectation of the state. And I just call that out because it is one thing I'm very proud of about our school system. Sometimes the, it's not just about meeting the standard of the, the state requirement, but it is how do we expect better to prepare our students to be prepared for the future? And so our, our algebra tells the perfect story of that. MCPS has also moved away from the expectation that algebra must be taught by a certain grade level. And we say that our goal is that students are to be successful in completing algebra in seventh, eighth, or ninth grade, ninth grade. So it's not just about taking the course, but it is about successfully completing it. Um, and we wanna ensure that our black and brown students have a strong mathematical foundation in algebra so that they can be prepared to take higher courses, not just in mathematics, but in courses like STEM and get exposure to STEM careers. Because those, when we think about mathematics, it, it's how, do it, it, how does it build the foundation for engineering and all of those great programs that we've established in high school, but we've got to get our kids there and we want them to be successful when they get into those programs. And uh, I found algebra to be some of the, the, you know, one of the great equalizers in that. And so the ERS study said, we have to pay attention to who's getting in algebra, right? And so how does this connect to COVID? So when we talk about contact tracing and why kids need to be in school and we don't need to address absences, it's because all of those things would be taken into consideration when there's a conversation about, oh, who should be in this course? Do we wanna hold them back because they were absent? They had a unique circumstance that they needed to work through. They may have been uh, doing very well in mathematics up to sixth grade, but if something happened as a result of COVID in sixth grade, then we need to understand what that circumstance is because if we see potential, we need to let the student have the opportunity and not come up with a host of reasons in terms of why we keep them out of that. Again, coming to the mindset of all the people who have to make decisions about our students and how they have to approach all of these conversations with what our students can do and what we expect for them to do. A couple other things I'll mention, Lisa, because you said you were going to talk fast, so I'm going to try to talk fast too. Um, in our Eureka Math curriculum, in that curriculum, we build a strong mathematical understanding with the new curriculum and training all components of equity and English language development for our secondary learners. And so that's taken into consideration how our curriculum personalizes the experiences for our ELL students. The primary talent development coaches, we have them in every single one of our Title I schools. And for everyone, our Title I schools are our schools that are impacted um, in, by poverty and we're putting additional supports so their job is to lesson plan, to model, to teach students who demonstrate the capacity to be able to thrive so that they can get access to upper level courses um, in elementary. And then of course, when they move on to middle and high school, we have the summer programming in Title I. Our upper grade elementary students are selected to participate in summer program. Now summer program is also one that we look at and say, this is how we provide that extra schooling time to our students who need that. So really opening up that opportunity, communicating with our families to know we need you to enroll, we want you to enroll. And Byron and Diego, you know, we've had many conversations about this, about how we have to even work with our families who um, may not see summer school as important for students, but why it is important. And if we know that you would benefit from it, we really need you to enroll. 
And are there anything that, that that's impacting the family or the student that makes them not want to attend? Because then we need to address that problem as well. We also centrally identify students in uh, fourth and fifth grade and, and fifth and sixth grade for mathematics courses. Um, starting last spring, OSIP began to identify names of students who would be placed in accelerated math courses. We found that students, uh, based on the data, more, more black and brown students surfaced, which then says schools are then allowed to add more students whom they believe would benefit from the program versus putting caps on those programs. And this is where advocacy comes in, right? Because we need our parents and everyone else to encourage your children when the school identifies them as uh, those who we think can accelerate because we have factors that show us so to push them to, to, to continue in that and not be afraid to take that challenge. We have George B. Thomas, Thomas Learning Academy that we have available on Saturdays. Um, just a host of things. The final thing I'll say, Lisa, is in addition to the data reference in that ERS question, the data show that nearly half of the students who take accelerated math courses in fourth grade and fifth grade elect to stop the extreme accelerated pathway by eighth grade. This is very true for students in all demographic groups. So it begs the question, what happens with that level of engagement when they get into middle school that makes them not want to continue? Now, I speak as a middle, a former middle school principal, and I say it is not, well, I love them, <laughs> okay? I'll take everybody's middle school kid because I actually get them. But um, it does speak to why, like, that encouragement, that peer community of support, when they make decisions based on what their friends do, when their friend, you know, when they're having conversations about, let's take this challenge on together. All of those things have to be considered um, as we continue to look at what causes that, that data to be what it was and, and then how are we gonna specifically address it? Um, the University of Maryland and John Hopkins both agree that the extreme acceleration of students causes gaps in learning and have recommended that we work to build a stronger foundation. And that just gets at the fact that nor do we wanna move students ahead just because, but we wanna build the foundation to make sure they're successful. So that's why when we look at courses, who's having access to what courses and what supports we want to put in place that has to start at the elementary level and then continue to build that confidence in the student and the family for them to be successful. Okay, that was six minutes and 47 seconds. I love it. So I have about two more minutes and I just want to ask you a question about STEM pathways. I know you have talked a little bit about it, but I just wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to add any value to your answer about how you can expand access for STEM learning opportunities for those who are in the underserved populations. Absolutely. So the first way is through building partnerships and not just partnerships, but partnerships that represent students seeing those who are successful in their fields, who look like them, who actually have, who, who are able to share a story that those students can connect with and be encouraged by. And I really believe that is powerful. Um, not everybody enters into a profession because they naturally just have an interest in it. Oftentimes it's about how they recognize their own strengths and may gain an interest through exposure. And a lot of times it's about exposure in which you can see yourself in someone else. And so I, when we look at these fields, but such as STEM, um, you know, and, and, and how these, some of the fields have not always been represented um, in ways that show a large number, number of people of color leading in these areas. We, when we do see it, we have to take advantage of it and develop and establish those partnerships so that our students can get that exposure, make the connections to say, this person did it, I can do it. And then, you know, this is how they get involved in doing these internships and jobs in areas that they don't even know that they were interested in. I'll take myself for an example. I went into college thinking that I wanted to go into marketing. I wanted to make lots of money. I said I was going to have fun, get dressed up, you know, do things that, for TV. I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. My first education class, my mother will say, it was the first time she said she didn't have to ask me, how are you doing in school? Because she saw me enjoying it. And so, you know, it was about, and at that time it was me being exposed to a number of other uh, friends and, and sorority sisters, quite frankly, who were in education, who seemed much happier than I was in doing what they were doing. So it's just about exposure to different people um, that helps you see your own strengths and things that, that may encourage you to, 
think about a path that you'd never considered before. And we, um, particularly families of color, have to think about that because we have a responsibility to diversify all of these professions. And it starts with our children. Thank you so much. I do have to say, I see you a lot on TV, so I'm not sure what happened, but you look good and uh, we appreciate everything that you do. I am now gonna turn it over to my good friend, Nora. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. McKnight. Thank you for being here today. I'm Nora Morales. I'm one of the program directors with Identity. Today, I'd like to ask you about um, our cultural competence in MCPS, uh, specifically, how does MCPS under your leadership plan to become a more culturally responsive system? How does it plan to better engage, respond to the needs, leverage the strengths, and seek the input of underserved Black and Brown communities in coming up with solutions which affect us the most? We have a lot of comments in the chat box and also in the Q&A from uh, parents who are asking for more culturally and linguistic uh, responses from the system. Can you address that? Yes, thank you, Nora, for that question. It's a very important one because it is critical that we work to become a more culturally responsive system. And that means we have to become a more culturally responsive county that means we have to become a more culturally responsive community. And I, I elevate that because the school system is a part of a whole and we have to think about how all of these pieces fit together. Unfortunately, we have not always done a good job of engaging underserved black and brown communities historically in Montgomery County Public Schools. And we first have to own that. And right after we own it, understand why. Now, why haven't we done it? We've had more than enough conversations about, you know, how do we do it? Uh, you know, who, who do we need to help us do it? Who has credibility in the community? How do we establish our own credibility? You know? Um, and so it comes down to those components. While there are some staff, schools, and departments who are culturally responsive, neither the awareness that is important nor the tools to do it well are consistent throughout our system, okay? And we know it. And I will say this is one of the main reasons that we employed the uh, anti-racist system audit because this was about a jump start to how do we automatically look at the systems that some say are working well, um, that we just continue to do because it's convenient, because we're not convicted enough to say, no, we actually need to look at all these systems, but we need to look at it from a lens of uh, an anti-racist lens. And so the audit is designed to have a comprehensive review of our practices and policies that we can make changes in to become a more culturally responsive and anti-racist system. And that's starting with policy um, written and implemented by the Board of Education to how does it translate into the experience that every single student has in the system every day. A committee has been meeting to ensure that we have the structures in place to holistically implement the actions to address the audit, um, but we haven't waited for the audit to begin to make changes. And I just wanna say that this isn't about doing a study to get a full report and then saying, what do you need to be done? I emphasize that Nora, because we should work on becoming an anti-racist system every single day. And there's some things that we're gonna find from this audit that we already know are problematic. So why not start to work on them right now? Like building culturally responsive uh, uh, practices with our staff and training them on how to be the staff that they need to be for our black and brown students in Montgomery County in this day and time when it's become even more, become more important uh, when issues have impacted them in greater ways as a result of the pandemic. So we continue to look at evidence of equity questions that were introduced and becoming a part of our normal central office process. That's why I mentioned that today in our board meeting, we were discussing, again, disproportionate numbers. And I said, we can discuss this all day. From my perspective as a superintendent, and I said to the staff at that point in time, we're not coming to this table discussing anything without starting with how does this discussion start with a lens of equity? If we're talking about learning, if we're talking about suspension, if we're talking about social emotional needs, we're not just talking about it as a topic. We're starting with who and how were they impacted? 
If we start every conversation like that, we'll stop trying to address these issues in this very um, obtruse and disconnected way. And that's a big part of the vision of what we have to do in Montgomery County. Um, that, that sounds wonderful, Dr. Uh, McKnight. And But right before we wrap it up, I just wanted to ask you one last question. Montgomery County is one of the few districts in the country where Black students in schools with few students living in poverty do the same or worse than Black students in schools with high rates of students living in poverty. Can you explain why that is happening and what does MCPS plan to do about it? Because we think it goes hand in hand with the cultural responsive response. And I agree with you, Nora. <laughs> 100%. In our summer leadership edition of Equity Matters, we had a principal, uh, Damon Harris, he's a principal at Wheaton Woods. He said that students with backgrounds uh, similar to mine remain at the bottom for most of the good categories and the top for most of the bad categories. We either need to believe that there is something inherently wrong with our students and their families to have them in this situation, generation after generation, or there's something wrong with our system that creates this demographic hierarchy. I agree with him 100% and I wrote that down and I've kept it because it gets at exactly what you're saying. Obviously these students look at me too and my family and this is all personal. This is why we talk about representation. Histories of structural racism persist in sectors of our county. It is manifested in our educational achievement, socioeconomic gaps, employment, income disparities, economics, concentration of poverty, housing patterns, just to name a few. The list could go on and on. And these disparities have made an impact on trends that we see in our schools. Using the equity accountability model, we can look across schools and truly identify in which schools we're serving black and brown students because we have some schools that are doing it. And that's why our commitment to continue to highlight how those schools are doing it, regardless of poverty level, regardless of different staffing situations so that that can tell the story of exactly how it can be done. Um, based on a school's level of poverty, we also differentiate resources, which I mentioned earlier, for example, with our Title I schools. But Nora, you just bring the point of um, this is a unique circumstance in MCPS, but I feel like it speaks to a it's a microcosm of a bigger issue that we have to look at in our entire county and our school system has to really address it um, and say, how do we even get out of these, you know, generational impediments to be able to create generational wealth? And how does that start in the educational structure and how one aids the other? Okay, so I'll stop there because I'm watching my time, thank but. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Renee. Renee, you're up. <clears throat> uh, hi, Dr. McKnight, I'm Renee Bossier. I'm a sophomore at Albert Einstein High School. And last week, a student at Albert Einstein High School testified before the Board of Education about an incident this fall at a soccer game where students of another school proceeded to shout racial um, taunts toward our schools. And this wasn't the first nor the last time that this happened this school year or past school years. So what can school staff and parents do to address these acts of racial bullying and what role can and should MCPS play in this? Well, nice to meet you, Renee, and thank you for asking that very important question. Um, it bothers me every single time I hear that, um, and we have incidents like that happen, because the question immediately becomes, what is the responsibility <clears throat> of the students and the adults and the families around to say that this is not acceptable and what's happening at home, what's happening within the school to make sure we don't continue to really relive these types of circumstances. Because everything that, uh, the school is just a microcosm of everything else that's happening in the world. Um, and so I, I first say it comes down to making sure that we continue to work with our leaders to call out and address when these things are absolutely unacceptable. And that takes courage. It takes courage and it's also, it also takes courage to be able to say, why did this happen? If it's race related, if it's, then we have to call that out because that then holds us accountable for saying, all right, we have to talk about what the problem is. And so this is where um, our, our focus on building the capacity of, and when I say our staff collectively, 
It's everybody. It's not just the experience of those who are in the classrooms with the students every day around expectations, but it's also the leaders who are charged with the responsibility of leading our schools. And um, when these incidents happen, to be very swift and reactive so that one, everybody gets the message that this is important and everybody gets the message that we're not going to tolerate this in our community because it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy emotionally, and we don't want the circumstance repeated. And then how, what is, how does accountability fit into this? And then how does repair fit into this? I personally believe that from every bad situation, every difficult situation, there's an opportunity for growth. And I especially believe that in the circumstances of our young people. Um, because, you know, not that we can't grow as adults. We do grow. I grow every day. I try to. Um, and, and I work very hard at that. And that's a personal commitment. But I also know that school represents the environment in which mistakes happen and they should happen. And we learn from them, whether it's academic or those uh, incidents that occur. So I, I say that the leaders have to be courageous, call it out, work with the students and have the swift follow up action to solve it. And, th and when I say solve, that means holding everyone accountable for what, you know, how they're going to move forward from that situation, if there are consequences that need to be involved, and calling the situation out for what it really is, so that you're having the right conversation and moving into that space of discomfort. Students are also encouraged to report these incidents immediately to the administration. Um, and I know it sounds like just a regular process, but then I feel like when it's reported, it's the student's responsibility to then share that accountability with the adults who are there, because then it becomes, what are you going to do about it? And if it's not administration, then it needs to be a trusted adult, because I continue to know that we have many trusted adults in our buildings that go beyond administrators, but they are classroom teachers, they're counselors, and everybody else. Um, we're always looking for ways to improve our practices, Renee. And I will say that you all as students always tell us the best way to do it, because you're living it on the ground every single day. Um, and I also and proud to say that that's why our student voice, we committed to saying has to be elevated in the anti-racist audit because it plays an important part in the continuous cycle of improvement. And as you all are going through and living these experience and experiences and observing these incidents, fortunate, unfortunate incidents, whatever it may be, you're able to help us understand and see what's happening and are able to make recommendations to us about how we should work with you to bring resolution to it. Of course, we have expertise we're bringing to that conversation, but I also credit our students because you all are smart and gifted in so many ways and, and help us figure out ways to solve the problems when we have your voice in the discussion. So study circles, I'm a big, a big proponent of. Um, it is a dialogue that invites people into a safe space to have difficult conversations. And I'm telling you, that's the thing that no one likes but it has to happen and our students can do it with one another, our staff can do it with one another and our students and staff can do it together all and community members as well, all around how do we solve issues around topics that are uncomfortable for us. So this program seeks to bring communities together, but everyone has to commit to doing the hard work to come together. And that means sometimes engaging in discomfort. So I wanna say we wanna continue to hear suggestions and incidents from you all when they occur so that we can do everything within our power centrally and locally, locally to make sure we don't repeat some of the incidents that do bring harm emotionally to students in our school system. So thank you for that, Renee. Of course, and thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to Ravon now. <clears throat> Ravon? So if, if she's not here, Byron, I'll be happy to ask the question since we got probably more than 20 comments yeah. about violence. Uh, many of our parents are very concerned about school climate, uh, violence inside of school, bullying, gangs, and they would like to know what MCPS can do to make the climate of the schools one that's more conducive towards studying and not that they can have to be afraid for the children's well-being. And if we can Thank make you. it short, because we want to get to more questions of people. But Thank you, please. Diego. The first uh, response would be, if there is something happening within a community that will help a school get ahead of a situation, I'm going to ask our community members to report it. It's much harder to get ahead of an issue when it's already happening, and then we're reacting to it. So I say that because 
it begs the question, what is everyone's responsibility in that? And so that's what I always ask of our families and our parents. If there is something, a conflict happening in a community, let us know what we can do or alert the school to it so that we can get in front of it. Because- So, so Moni, if I can ask you a question, yep. who should we call? Because sometimes our parents raise the issues and they're not listened to. So I think it's important to have someone that will really listen to them. Uh, so may, maybe it's not a solution you can give us right now, but maybe there's a number that we can call the community can call when they they are afraid of situations or no situations. Because sometimes, again, because of cultural racism, uh, things they're not listened to by by school authorities. So uh, we have to oh. find a way where their their information can get to whoever needs to get to. But Diego, my response assumed that there is also a trusted individual on the staff at every school that a parent should feel comfortable calling. Now, if that's not the case, that's a whole other issue we need to work on. But I do like your recommendation of sometimes people a little more comfortable sharing information where it doesn't come back on them as a personal reflection. So maybe some sort of a hotline um, in which they can call in and share information and then we can, you know, they can let us know if we can follow up, but at least we have the information that we can be responsive to. So I actually like that as a recommendation. Well, I, it is unfortunate that many of our parents don't feel that they have someone they trust at a school. So I think that that would be a solution right now. But if they call, what, what can the school do? Well, the school first then has the information so that they can then say, all right, how do we gather more information to understand the complexity of the problem, get with those who are involved and try to do the things, which is exactly why we have the restorative justice coaches to be able to bring students together and whether it's engaging in a conversation, a dialogue, a study circle, or talking to them individually to understand what the issue is so that we can figure out what is going to be the entry point for trying to solve the problem. If it's a larger community problem, like a gang problem or something like that, of course, we have the street outreach network and other, you know, other partners that we work with who can help and partner with the school system to solve those issues. Well, let's, let's, let's start with getting the information to where it needs to get to. So I'm going to pass it to Rivon, but it's not, I don't see her. Maybe Renee wants to ask the last question about the teacher and staff shortages. shortages. Oh. Or maybe Byron, you want to ask? Yeah, I'll go ahead and ask that. Um, Dr. McKnight, um, <clears throat> you know, we understand that there's been a declining teachers and counselors and hiring shortages. Um, how are they being handled now? And what are the plans to address really the that well-qualified staff um, going forward, uh, especially in uh, the underserved, uh, underserved communities where black and brown children are, you know, largely occupying, uh, are, are serving as students? Yes, I'll quickly begin to say this is, <laughs> you could have asked me the same question a year ago or two years ago, but quite frankly, the issue is even in more dire need now because of COVID-19, which is unfortunate. Um, on December 16, the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, um, sent a letter out to educators across the United States just really saying he wanted to underscore the dire, very real shortage of teachers and counselors in education that's really impacting us. And we've seen that decline here in Montgomery County as we've seen across the nation. I, I will say for us in our community, and I go back to why there has to be representation, I believe strongly um, within a school, not one to benefit those who want to see other, other educators and others within their school who are similar to them, but also for those who don't. Again, it speaks to the strength of why we wanna have diverse environments within all of our schools. And MCPS is committed to doing that. Um, we have committed to um, recognizing that MCPS can go out and recruit, but we also have to create the environment in our schools in which people want to stay. So we, 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 we can go out and hire everyone, but we also have to work with everybody within those environments in every school and every office to say, when we do hire more staff and you do bring diversity in your office, how are these people treated? How are they respected? How are they, fold, how are they folded into the work to honor their expertise, to honor who they are, the diversity that they bring so that they wanna stay. Um, and, and so I think that's a very big part of it. 
We also um, have the opportunity to broaden our recruitment in so many ways differently than we've done before now that we're able to do it virtually. Going out to the Midwest and going out to other places and recruiting for who we know we need um, in our school district, but you know, going to uh, other countries, you know, we, we, we did quite a bit of recruitment in Puerto Rico this year um, to continue to bring in uh, our, our, our <coughs> excuse me, our uh, Latino staff members. And so being very intentional about who do we want and where are we going to get them? And I'll use myself as an example. I mean, I sit here constantly thinking about how do I diversify my staff and how do I diversify my staff and find someone who has the skills and knowledge to do a monstrous job and be successful in it, and where do I find them? And I tell you, I even come to the, the conclusion that sometimes our processes of just going through uh, advertising the role and, and having people come interview for it is not enough. I have even gone to the point of saying, uh, even from, from my leadership positions, I may very well entertain a search firm, <laughs> you know, who have experience in these areas to go out and find um, what we need and in these cases when we've gone through it enough times to see that the traditional processes do not work. And so some of those same types of recruitment areas and, and ways that we be very innovative, uh, we have to do the exact same thing from uh, all of our schools to our offices to my office. Okay, thank you. Let me, let me, one of the questions came up in the chat and it relates to something uh, around a COVID topic. <clears throat> MCPS generally states it takes guidance from uh, its guidance for COVID response with DHHS. But recently <laughs> there were articles from the county officials um, stating that, you know, MCPS on, on occasions does not follow their their direction, so it's a bit of a um, communications uh, confusion. I'll say to put it mildly. Can you just talk about the situations where um, MCPS differs in its decision from with regard to COVID uh, from DHHS, and what can be done to improve the communications? with the uh, community, because there's a fair amount of concern over there. Yes, and I hate that our families have to read and hear that because the last thing I ever wanted for our families in this county to feel like they're caught in the middle of agencies. That should never be anybody's uh, question or concern. Um, we always rely on guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services who receive their guidance from the Maryland Department of Health because we are educators. We don't know epidemiology. We don't know, I mean, other than what we see on the news and what we read, a, a health pandemic requires that you get the direction and guidance needed from those who specialize in health. So in terms of us taking direction from uh, Department of Health and Human Services, we have done that along the way of the pandemic because we don't know, we're, our, our area is teaching, learning, instructional leadership in education. And so being clear about what we know and who we are um, sets the stage for that. So the only, the, I can give you one example, and this is the only one that I'm aware of, and I'm aware of all of it because I've been in the center of all of the collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services since we've started with this pandemic. And this one was most recently, actually as recently as last week when the Department of Health and Human Services did make a recommendation that we switch the student quarantine and isolation to five days. So that was the one time, the one thing we didn't change, and it goes back to the communication because we just communicated with our families when? Last week that we were moving staff to five days for isolation and quarantine and, and remaining students at 10. If we then came the next week and changed for families one week after that, 160,000 families saying that we were making a change, then everybody's trying to figure out how, how do you make sense of that adjustment? And the other reason we, uh, we, we said we're not ready to switch to a five-day quarantine and isolation for students is because one, not all of our students have gotten the vaccine and we actually just started the vaccine process for our early learners. 
Um, and so with that said, you just expect that you have a larger unvaccinated population in our elementary schools. And so we wanna keep them safe and we wanna keep them in school. And so knowing that if we can go to 10 days of, of uh, 10 calendar days of quarantine and then get them back in person soon, we'd rather do that than have them out for five days and then they're still not well and then there's disruption that we can't plan for. The other part of that is, um, you know, there's guidance from the, from the Maryland Department of Health and CDC that says the only way that you can go to a, or the only way they recommend students going to a five-day quarantine would be if you can guarantee that students are not congregated in the large areas and unmasked. Well, we have lunch in schools in which students are in the cafeteria. Yes, we have um, put in many protocols with spacing and having outdoor lunches, but that's not something that we can guarantee. And so I do feel very accountable to our families when we think about these guidances because we have to be able to translate that guidance into school. If that were not there, I would say we would be moving, if that one piece of guidance was not there, I would see no reason why we wouldn't move to five days immediately. So that's the best example that I can share with you that is also the most recent example in which MCPS has ever done anything um, that would be different from that guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services, one example. Great. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wainai. So we have, again, lots of questions about parents are very afraid of violence and the well-being of the children. But one of the questions that they're asking is, why doesn't MCPS make them part of the solution? Uh, I, I cannot retrace back the questions, but, <clears throat> but I find it hard to see kids fighting if they see their neighbors walking down the hallway. I don't know the legal implications of that, but it would be great parents understand the problem and they want to help. So we have to find ways to involve them and be part of the solution because they believe they can make a difference where maybe MCPS <clears throat> can't. The other big issue, so that's something for you to consider. The other big issue, and it's not a new thing. No? Um, the other big issue that the parents are talking about are masks. As you know, many of our families are not wealthy families and they would like to get good masks they're concerned that the masks that they're getting are not good, <clears throat> but good masks. And what happens if the mask breaks or gets dirty? Will they be able to get uh, masks as needed for their children? Thank you, Diego. Um, first question, I do believe our parents can help us when it comes down to, to addressing those issues. I would like for us to follow up. I will personally, and I want to sit in a group with our parents because I wanna hear how they can help. When I can hear that directly from them, then I can come back and implement that in our processes and procedures. And I wanna personally do that. So we can make that as a follow-up. I can come back to a meeting, um, but I, I do think that's something that we need to follow up on because until we make it happen, and I'm, I'm right in the center of this and I can make that happen, but I wanna hear from them and hear the ideas about how, what, how they think they can help. Okay. So the math. So can, can I say one more thing? I just saw sure. a comment that sometimes, and I'm talking about our immigrant population who don't, who don't speak English. Sometimes I just saw a comment that I heard many times in the past. Someone said that, that the front desk staff sometimes treats our community so badly, and someone just wrote that it might seem that it's like a requirement you know, in order to get the position. So when we talk about accountability for students, for, for the principles regarding students, it's also important to evaluate people at the front desk that for many of our parents are the only connection they have with. It's the only person that they connect with and if they're treated poorly, then they never go back to school and that could be a huge barrier. So when we talk about cultural competency, it'd be great. We can also make sure that people at the front desk understand that they're also being watched, not just by the memos that they write for the principal, but as to how they interact with their community. Sorry, now we can go to the mask. No, Diego, I'm not ready to go to that one because <laughs> that, that's a problem. I have one thing, two things to say. The immediate issue is if that happens, I want the parent to report it to the principal. I will tell the principals that tonight I said this in this meeting that I've asked the parent if they felt like they have not been treated fairly or respected, that I've asked them to report it to the principal because I want someone to be responsive to that and address it. Because the I problem is that our, our parents, what if our parents will feel scared of retaliation and it has happened. So that's, that's the truth. So we have to find a way 
our parents can provide feedback where they feel safe. Again, well, let's we can, add that on to our follow-up community okay, discussion. Let's do it. We need to talk about it. that. Yeah, but let's go to the mask. Thank you. Okay. All right. The mask. <laughs> you got me wound up on that one. I forgot about masks. So yes. There was some information put out where there was some questions around a tag that was put on masks that made our community question whether they were authentic masks or not. We've put on our website the clarification that yes, we have masks that are meeting standard that have gone through um, inspection and are the safe masks for our students. And that's why we actually ordered the KN95 masks. So we have ordered enough for students to have two masks per week. Um, however, if a student loses a mask, a mask gets dirty, yes, we have many extra masks. Now, not all KN95 masks, but we've been able to pro provide um, masks for students in the school building since we came back in the, in the fall. So the KN95 mask, it takes a little bit longer to get them in. That's why we started out with two per week. But of course, if we, we'd rather a student have a mask, even if we don't have additional KN95 masks right now so that they are protected. Thank you. Just one more comment, Byron, I'll give more time to you, but it'd be also great if the COVID tests that are given to people, if there was a video of something in Amharic, in English, in French, because, oh, sorry, in Spanish, in French, because the instructions are in English. So our families don't know how to use. Them. Again, these are all examples of cultural competence. Sorry, Byron. Yeah. <clears throat> great. Um, you know, one, one thing, uh, Dr. McKnight, that I know you're very familiar with is from last year is that um, when we quarantine or go virtual uh, for, for some of our students that are um, most impacted, um, learning in a virtual environment has not worked, especially for uh, some of the long, youngest learners. Can you talk about what the system is doing? I know we're trying to get through this surge right now, but what is the system doing to uh, learn from the uh, what we encountered last, last year and to try to provide for families where virtual is, uh, you know, parents have to work, and young children home alone in environments that aren't necessarily conducive of uh, working. So what, if anything, is the school system able to do for them? Yes, um, thank you. So what, what we've learned, I, I wanna announce something I saw in the chat as well. If there's anyone who's saying that your school or your child have not received what they need, if you could just note in the chat your school, so then we can follow up. This is how it starts, having that follow up with the parent, because I'm gonna have our operations call, I mean, our operations office reach out to every single one of these schools to figure out what's happened. Um, to your question, so thank you for the comments in the chat. To your question, Byron, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about our programs that we um, have found to provide more engaging opportunities for students um, that we found are better programs to use when we are engaging the student virtually. And so we've learned about what those programs are, whether they are you know, like discovery and science and all of those things to include videos and, and all of, of, of those pieces so that when a student is online all day long, we know that what are some of the interactive uh, types of lessons and enrichment activities within that lesson that does engage the student who's sitting in front of a computer for six, seven hours, whatever it may be. Um, the other part, and I, and I just attribute this to, to uh, Black and Brown Coalition and working with the Children's Opportunity Fund, is those equity hubs. The equity hubs in so many ways have, have, have really just helped the school system and families because when those schools have to transition to virtual and parents then have to go to work, Sometimes it's just about where is there a safe place that is familiar within the community in which there are trusted adults there who can be there to provide support to a student and just a space for them to still be able to um, uh, work within the virtual learning environment and not have to navigate being at home by themselves and all of those other pieces that come along with the adjustments that have to be made. So even when we transitioned schools this past week, I am sitting here with a grateful heart that, you know, Children's Opportunity Fund, along with others, helped to create uh, many daycares who were willing to utilize our schools who are now transitioned to virtual to create the space for the hubs 
so that uh, parents can bring those students to those spaces and have a safe space with an adult there who can help them navigate the virtual learning environment. So those are two that come to mind immediately. Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so Byron, Byron, may I say something? Go ahead. Uh, Dr. McKnight, we are going to, we made a promise, I made a promise to everyone that we are gonna get you everyone's questions and comments because in their comments, you see the desperation, the fear of retaliation, um, and, and, and the desire to really do more and better to help you in your quest to make MCPS a, a more fair uh, school where all of our children can, can learn and be safe. Uh, <clears throat> This is the first time, and, and I apologize to everyone that we cannot get to all of your questions and, and comments, uh, but maybe this is a sign that we have to do more of these. But we want you to look at all the questions and comments so that you see the other side of a reality because our issues and concerns tend not to get to you, no? because as soon as someone ignores them, you can no longer get to the powers that be. And there have been many stories of, of families shut shut out of a school uh, because the use of power is real, particularly when you feel powerless. So we made a commitment and maybe uh, in not so long a time, we can have a, another one where we can focus on, on some of these issues that our parents are bringing up that are heart-wrenching, really heart-wrenching. Uh, I, I really wanna take, I'll give you the, the last word, Byron and, and Dr. McKnight, and I really want to thank the parents who took the time. I know you're busy, you have children at home to write. I know for some of you, it's difficult to, to write your, your comments, to express yourself. We are listening. Uh, it has been our experience that Dr. Mike Knight has been very responsive to, to the things that we bring to her. It's also true that it's hard to change a, a system that has operated this way for, for decades. But uh, we commit to sharing everything with Dr. Mike Knight and with MCPS. And maybe doing, I'm, I'm going to commit Byron to doing another, another session uh, because obviously there haven't been very many forums where our grassroots black and brown and other brothers and sisters have been able to, to speak freely about their issues. Sorry, okay. Byron. Thank you, Diego. That's actually a great, a great summary. And um, just as we approach the close of the event, um, I want to thank everyone again for attending, but Dr. McKnight, especially you, I know you've had some uh, grueling days uh, where others, you know, don't even know that that you really didn't have any break between Christmas and uh, New Year's at all. You, you and your your cabinet worked uh, feverishly to try to get things ready for the reopening. Um, I wanted to give you a few minutes for closing comments and for you to uh, kind of just summarize your thought. Thank you, Mr. Johns. I'm sitting with what Diego just said, and I just wanna say, I don't want us to have these forums to talk and then nothing changes as a result of it, because that's not a good use of anybody's time. So yes, I do want us to quickly follow up and <clears throat> really talk about what we're, what solutions that we're all going to do to address these issues and really naming who needs to do what and how we're going to do it. And then how we're gonna establish a system of accountability for everybody. And what I'd also like is in those conversations and you know, I, I can talk about this all night. If you told me I had another hour, I'd sit here with you and we continue to talk. But I also believe in accountability and as, as passionately as I feel about this and as much as I am desperate to get these problems solved, everybody who represents my vision have to feel the exact same way. So I was sitting here reflecting saying, you know, how important would it be for every single one of my cabinet? I'm looking at the chat and people are saying masks. You know, when I'm having the conversation, I'm trying to figure out where well, everybody's getting masks and they're telling me yes. Well, you know, if we're not getting them, now I know parents are saying it, what are we gonna do about it? Cause I'm all about that accountability. We can have the conversation, but we gotta get to what we're gonna do. So yes, I want us to get back together. I wanna engage with our family so that they can give thoughts, ideas, recommendations about what we can do. And I'm gonna leave us with this question. 
in Montgomery County, I talked about the strength of our county really rests in the fact that we are such a diverse community. So if we can accomplish these barriers and these issues that we're talking about here in Montgomery County, if not here, then where? Where can it be done? Yes, we cannot achieve equitable outcomes for black and brown students in Montgomery County public schools if we don't commit to doing it. And where can it be done if it's not done here? So I just say that because we know we need to change the status quo. This is a big system that has a long history of success, but a long history of success, not for everyone. And we all have to be connected on what we need to do to change that history for the betterment of our children. And we all have a part in that. So let's get back together soon. Let's talk about it. Most importantly, let's develop an action plan together that we can follow up on and hold each other accountable for doing. So I wanna thank you for the conversation tonight. I'm all fired up now and looking forward to the next step of this because we have a lot of work to do and we need to roll our sleeves up and we need to get it done. And I appreciate right. your partnership in it. Thank you so much, uh, Monifa. I just wanna also tell the parents, it is important for Dr. Bagnite and the board to see that black and brown participate. We can go to board meetings together when it's safe, but if you want to <clears throat> join the Black and Brown Coalition, uh, I'm not going to give you my phone number because I won't be able to, to answer your question. But uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, but um, if we have the information, the that, chat box. The chat box. Okay, Nora, if you can give people the information as to how to join forces with us so that we can be more and better advocate for black, brown, and poor students in Montgomery County. Well, thank you. Thank you all. It's been a, a, it has passed so fast. There are a lot of topics that we will want to follow up on. Dr. McKnight, we will take you up on uh, your offer to follow up. I know you, uh, you truly believe in accountability for this. So we'll make sure that there we, uh, we quickly get together on, on these. Um, again, thank you all the families from uh, uh, both the Spanish speaking French and Amharic families that joined us today. Thank you interpreters and for all the MCPS staff that helped put this together and for um, both identity and the parents council members that were part of putting this program together. So thank you again, have a great night and we'll uh, look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Buenas noches, good evening, good night, and thank you. Gracias. Thank you.